There is always something we can do to improve where we're at. Positivity is what's required. You know, to, to offer this opportunity for people around you. You need their positivity. And talk about it in a positive way. Positivity, we heard already from, uh, from, from Jackie. Positivity was what was required when they, when they both got made redundant within a week. Back in 1998. That took some, oh by the way, <laughs> never miss an opportunity, but in my third book. <laughs> And then they, and they came on board with Clean and Easy, but they didn't they just come on board, they, they, they were proactive in what they did. They went to the meetings where all the superstars were, and they read their books, but they're not ready. They listened to their CDs, and they earned what they earned, if not more. She's now on footballers' wages now. That's positivity. But you know what? It's not easy when you're going through a tragedy. I'll just say, I'll take out the pens right now. There are things that you are not doing in this clean easy business that you've heard other people do, or ideas that you've got in your mind, that, oh, maybe I should try that, or I'll do it some other time. So take out your pens right now. Write, write down three things that you can do that you haven't done yet. Take some action. <coughs> Anybody got their pen out? You can wear the ear up for Just give it a nudge. What are you writing down? I'm interested. Easy party. Most of you are not involved in easy parties yet. You've got to sign up. Write down, but do you know what? Don't just write it down. Do it. Commit to doing it. It will make all the difference. They did to me when I'm bringing mum down. Do you know what? Do you know what? Although I did think in a positive way when mum died, it didn't quite turn out that way, did it? Because you know what? Things don't always turn out the way I'm hoping for. Um, without going into too much detail, because this is being streamed around the UK apparently, um, my dad wasn't the kind of person I would like to like him to have been. He used to drink all the time. We used to do whiskey sometimes out of the bottle, became a different person. But it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad. Because a few months after we moved into this new house, I guess to lighten the atmosphere, they said we could have a, we could have a dog. We've got this little white mongrel, Winnie. I'll never forget Winnie. I'll never forget this little white thing. I'll never forget running downstairs on the morning in my bare feet and stepping in these little piles of dog dirt that I should never <laughs> And that feeling of it oozing between my toes. Sometimes warm. <laughs> Has that happened to anybody? Don't admit to that. <laughs> My dad drowned the dog in the bath. He killed the dog. And he didn't stop with the dog. We all suffered at the hands of my father. He was a very violent person. I'm actually not going to go into detail right now because it has been streamed, but it was a man you did not want to cross. He put my step on the hospital out, which he left in a particularly vicious meeting. But you know what? I forgive my dad. He's my dad, and I love him. Just wasn't quite the kind of person I would like to have had around at the time. And um, while this was going on in the house, outside of the house, Mum's killer was killing more and more people. I thought, Do you know what? I thought he was going to kill me. Especially when he killed a 16 year old girl called Jane McDonald. She used to live seven houses away from where we lived with my mum. Seven houses away. She even babysat for us. And when he killed her, I thought, oh, no, he's going to kill me. He was never going to kill me. That's what we sometimes do as human beings. We create these scenarios in our mind that are much worse than the truth, or, and then they're not based on fact. It was never going to kill me. I'm sure he made it eight. You can probably understand why I didn't feel quite as good as everybody else. All my clothes were from the jumble sale. Um, people come up to me at school and say, hey, is it true about your mum being this Yorkshire just first six? Is it true your mum was a prostitute? I hated that. I thought that everybody else was better than me. They weren't better than me, but I thought they were. I was damaged goods. I was never going to achieve anything. And to top it off, do you know, to make, to make matters even worse, I had ginger hair as well. <laughs> <laughs> ginger matter. Yeah, just a light, light, light in the atmosphere. I know my story's not happening, but I do promise you, it's like a happy ending at the end to just give it some balance. It was tough, guys, but in 1981, in fact, 30, 35 years ago, um, was going to pass the anniversary actually. Peter Sutton was arrested on the 3rd of January uh, 1981. And we could all breathe this collective sigh when it was over. And it'd be fair to say that I've got better after that. Not completely, still with dad's content with him. Uh, my sister Sonia in 82 with this one, she started mixing with the wrong crowd. She, she was drinking, she was glue sniffing and stopping out there. And I did, all, I did all that stuff. Sniffing glue, sniffing aerosol, I was trying to be accepted by my friends. But my dad beat Sonia, Sonia so bad that I put her to hospital two days and after that she was taken uh, from the hospital into a secure children's home and Sonia never lived with us again. Do you know what? I missed her. I missed her. 
in 1983, 1913, a few things, a few positive things happened because, first of all, I joined the same school at Sunderland, so that was fantastic. And people at school stopped asking me about my mum. I was glad about that. And, and my dad stopped hitting me when I became this teenager. Oh, I'll say that. There were still big arguments in the house with him, you know. Um, so you're always like, you've got teenage children, hormones flying around the body. I had big arguments and on one occasion, maybe two, um, I'd run away from home on, and I slept in the streets. I actually slept in the streets. First time I slept in the streets was in a bus shelter. No, it wasn't. The first time was in a portal on a building site, freezing. But I always went home the next day with me telling two minutes. But the main thing was, it wasn't hitting me. But that year, something happened. It was incredible. Mr. Hill, my English teacher, I've just smirked there because I've heard from Mr. Hill this week, and you'll realise why I've smirked in a minute because he was quite an influential person in my life. The English teacher came up to me and said, Richard, why don't you enter the school public speaking competition? I thought, you're joking. Get on, get on the stage in front of the school, it's like an uncle. Ginger air. <laughs> but then I thought about it. I thought about it. What's the worst that could happen? It's a great, great phrase there. What's the worst that could happen? See, I've got a great benchmark to compare things against. I think it was the first thing that good time that I said, I can. I can at least try. I can at least try. I put my name forward to represent Newton House. It was going to be me because nobody else put my name forward for some reason. I was given two weeks to learn my subjects and off we went. Four of us actually went. Two weeks later, we were marching to the school hall, a bit like this, it's like a bit smaller. And um, the four speakers were on the front row, and I was sat at the edge of my, and because my name came last alphabetically, and I can't, I was the last speaker there. Which meant I could see what everybody else was like. They were fantastic. Stood at the podium, reading their notes like politicians, they had assistants, they had posters, flip charts, diagrams, they were fantastic. But then it was my turn. Oh. I nervously kind of stepped onto the stage, I walked across the stage, I couldn't even look at the audience. Got to the middle and I turned round. Woof. I started speaking. About the one thing that I knew something about, but we never did yes, I'm sure we Pigeons. <laughs> My dad kept pigeons. Some of you, do you remember the film Kes with his Kes drawing? It was a bit like that in the house. It was my job to feed them, so I knew all about them. But the thing is, I didn't do what everybody else did. I didn't stand up there. I stood here on my own. No notes, no posters, no foot chats, nothing. And I spoke from the heart, as we all should. When the five minutes were over, I walked to the right hand side of the stage. I leaned down behind the curtains and picked up this pigeon that I brought with me. And I, uh, I was extending its wings on stage. There you go, wasn't it? It was like a man. And, um, <laughs> Mind you, I, I've always been able to handle the birds. <laughs> I didn't even say. Say that again. You said I've got ginger there. Yeah, I have got ginger there. I have got ginger there. It's all right. But I can shave it off. I can dye it. You're always going to look like that. Go uh, out the side doors that were open. Uh, that was uh, Summer's Day, that was outside. Whew, whew, off it went. Everyone was like, Look at this pigeon. And uh, do you know what? For me, it was of my proudest moments. I told myself, I can. And I did. There is so much power in those two words, guys. Can I do how proud I felt? The next day, in assembly, when Mr. Stanley, head of year, announced that Richard McCann had won first place. I won it. Cry my eyes out. Do you know when you get that quiver in your throat? Like when you watch your next factor. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I didn't cry, but do you know what did happen? Something changed inside. Something changed in the way that I saw myself fit in, and I realised when I won it, hey, I'm not completely damaged goods, and maybe I could amount to something. But when I think about winning it, the potential to win it was always in there. It was always in there, wasn't it? I wonder what else I had the potential for as a young person that I didn't get to uncover. Formula One driver, tap dancing, pianist, never tried any of those things. See, we've all got the potential to do a little bit more if we really want to. But you know what, sometimes it takes a bit of that courage. It's not a coincidence that I found the courage and got on stage age 13, won that competition, and I'm stood in front of 3,000 people at NIA Birmingham right now. It's not a coincidence. 